This is Joseph Coco. I'm at APE 2017 on behalf of Becca Hilburn's Art Process blog and YouTube channel. If you could introduce yourself, please. Sure. My name is Glenn Song. I'm the creator of the comic This Mortal Coil, and uh, I also work in the games industry. Okay, cool. Uh, so what's uh, about APE particularly stood out to you? Is this your first time coming here? It's not my first time coming to APE. Uh, I was an APE. I had a table in APE with a bunch of friends in 2010. Okay, and, and that's uh, when it was in San Francisco? That's when it was up in on... San Francisco. Okay. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm tabling, this is the first year I'm tabling with my stuff, my my comic, my artwork. So okay. that's the big difference between then and now. Um, I guess the other big difference is the size of it. Um, you mean the size of the show? The size of the show, yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, definitely downgraded a bit since it's come to San Jose. Yeah. Um, so can you speak a little bit about um, what uh, the show was like uh, when it was in San Francisco? Uh, it definitely, there was a lot more people when it was in San Francisco. Yeah, um, was it the same demographic, do you think, though? Like, I know one of the reasons um, people... Uh, one of the reasons why San Francisco got more traffic is because it was starting to adopt uh, more pop culture sort of things and a little bit less comics. Yeah. Um, so, do you think it was the same people coming? N maybe not the exact same people, I, so but I, the same type of the people The way I understood, the like, um, Ape in 2010 is that it was owned by the San Diego Comic Con folks. Yeah. And so, and I guess like people who uh, do that convention, or I, I think it was like free if you had a convent, you've got a pass to SDCC or something. And so, cool. I'm guessing people from that just spilled over. Yeah. Plus, it's in the city, so and San Francisco is a lot bigger and more busy. And, um, of course. I, I know they had like dealers, they had even panels and stuff, even though I didn't go to them. They were like. <laughs> I don't want to say like big I mean, name. There's, there's panels were... here, but yeah, we went in 2015, I believe, in San Francisco. Uh -huh. The last year they had it there. I don't know if that was 14 or 15, but um, yeah, there was some big name people I think okay. doing panels at that time. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I heard it changed ownership, and then it came here, and then yeah. like last year it was bigger. This year it's smaller. So sure. Um, I don't know what's going on with them, but <laughs> yeah, that's fine. It was um, nice so... to be back at Abe. <laughs> in any case. Definitely. Indie Comic Cons, there's not enough. And then they all seem to congregate in big cities. San Jose yeah. um, is smaller than San Francisco, I, yeah. I assume. So yeah, it's, it's good to see that um, even smaller cities can support uh, independent Comic Cons. Mm -hmm. But can you tell me a little bit about your work? Yeah, sure. Uh, my work is mainly this webcomic uh, in print, that's in print form. It's called This Mortal Coil. Okay. And it's about a uh, kind of young startup Shinto deity who uh, helps humans who get involved with monsters, demons, and other gods from the eternal realm. So that's like the big overarching story. This is one episode of this mortal coil. Okay. Uh, so this, this book itself is a complete story. It's called The Rabbit in the Moon, in which the Lady of the Moon, uh, Chang Yi, uh, who comes from Chinese mythology, she is... Uh, She's an immortal, first of all, but she gets uh, she gets attacked by this wolf demon. It's all explained kind of in the backstory, but she gets attacked okay. and Kamiko comes to her rescue to try and save her and stop this wolf demon from trying to regain his immortality. All right, and can you tell me about some of the inspirations uh, behind the world and the story itself? Sure. Um, some of the inspirations, like when I first created when I first came up with the idea, it was like a combination of things like uh, Death Note, so very anime, pop culture, yeah, uh, heavily influenced. Uh, some Western comics, uh, like like Sandman. If you go to the website, there's one comic that was kind of references Sandman, uh, and also uh, just like Japanese, uh, like fashion was another thing. Like I, interesting. So comic is dressed as a Lolita. If you look at the, this coloring book is this was like a uh, way to kind of expand on that idea. Like, I had done a version of her for this comic, which I thought, you know, didn't quite fit that aesthetic, and I wanted to explore it more. So I started doing these concept sketches in this in this coloring book. Okay. Uh, really, they were meant to just be like different studies. different studies, different like looking at actual designs. Yeah. Uh, some of them are ones I created. Some of them are outfits I found online. The line looks beautiful. Thank you. 
And it was basically just a way to kind of explore what her character would look like with different outfits and how I could present the fashion going forward as part of the her character and the story. Yeah, that's really cool. I feel like um, outside of the realm of uh, alternate history comics and history comics, people don't explore uh, outfit design often enough. Um, right. I know it's something Becca spends a lot of time on. She um, puts she puts up Pinterest boards uh, trying to get inspiration for what her characters would yeah, look like. Yeah, I, I do a lot of that too. I look at Pinterest for... Because um, I don't think of myself as a fashionable guy, but that doesn't mean my webcomic character shouldn't be fashionable. Sure. So I look at Pinterest for a lot of inspiration for this. Uh, yeah, it even, gives a lot of life to your characters. Yeah, yeah. Like, I want to give them their own identity and their own life. And yeah. this is a way of doing it. And these, as these pictures grew, they got more and more complicated because they started telling... not They weren't just outfit designs. Some were, like, they started telling stories, like... Um, this one, it's like she has a gun, it's like, where did she get it? Uh, as it goes on, it gets kind of weirder and weirder. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like that comes also part and parcel with, with my webcomic world. As I developed this, I was also developing my ideas for it. And, um, That's cool. So this was happening... Um, this was you mostly... Were, you were making all these sketches. Did you intend for them to be a coloring book? Or it I, was just you, like you said, exploring the idea of your Originally, characters? they were meant to be just like an exploration, uh, just concept art, really. And I, what I had done was I had turned into this 360 turntable. Uh, my friend looked at it and said, like, you know what, this would make a nice coloring book. And so yeah. I thought, well, I'll give my hand at self-publishing one. And so I used Create cool. Space and uh, some freeware tools and basically put this book together. Nice. And how do you feel the audiences at Ape are responding to coloring books? Do you think people are walking around looking for that, or are they mainly focused on comics? I mainly focused on comics, based on the sales. I've had more sales of the comic. I, had, I sold one or two coloring books. Okay. Um, these books you can actually get on Amazon, and uh, yeah. they, actually, they, sell, they sold fairly well. I would say for you know me just putting it together and putting it out there like there are things it's not is perfect it, is it other comics people I don't know how much information Amazon is giving you through create space or is it be, like to be honest like no information really okay. um, I don't know what the demographic is I assume the people who buy this are interested because they want to find adult coloring books yeah that. makes sense uh, there's not many dresses or something that there aren't a whole lot of rules for right. coloring maybe so right exactly I mean, there's, I mean, there's a huge market of like adult coloring book uh, folks out there. If you, sure. Like if you go on Facebook and stuff, you can find a lot of stuff about uh, making coloring books and people who are who get adult coloring books for, uh, I think mostly like stress relief or dealing with like, you know, various therapy or yeah or uh, like physical therapy. Cancer, Distract them from life, Bas basically. Like basically, yeah. yeah. Uh, what what a lot of people our age, I think. Um, use video games for. Exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it definitely, like, when you look online at coloring book um, groups, you'll find the demographic skews older. And, yeah. Um, so I think it's hitting a different demographic in that sense. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think it's be like, the response here hasn't been too overwhelming for coloring books because I think it's still mostly about uh, comic books. But sure. I brought it here to see what the response would be. Yeah, and I mean, you've got half a table, so there's plenty of room right for your, your prints and your exactly. uh, comics and coloring books. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you mentioned to me uh, when we were talking earlier that you have a computer science background. Yeah. Um, were you, did you go into computer science looking to develop video games, or did you go into computer science more as just a love for computer science? Uh, mostly to develop video games. Okay, yeah, like, I mean, that that's kind of why I got it, into it It's kind of well, like so. your typical, I guess, I'm not from Silicon Valley, but it's kind of like your typical story of a, like I, I got into programming when I was a kid. I learned how to code. Yeah. Pascal, C, C++, basic. Yeah. Uh, Which is not what was in that order at the time. Right. <laughs> not in that order. I, eventually, I learned C++ because that's the that is the language game speak. That's the that's the one that's closest to the metal. Yeah. And um, and I you know I made I made game prototypes and stuff at home. I don't want to say prototypes, but I made small little parts of games. Sure. And uh, and then I got into CS. I went to USC. I got my undergrad and my master's degree in like computer graphics. And uh, I got an internship at Electronic Arts that way. Nice. And, so, and were you pursuing art the whole time that you were doing that? Um, as a hobby. Maybe not, yeah, as professionally, yeah, not, but not just drawing when, yeah, not as when you have free time? Right. Okay. okay that's interesting because... Um, I mean, I imagine a lot of independent game developers have that sort of background, but I haven't talked to too many people who uh, 
manage to both keep up their art chops while uh, diving deep into uh, software development. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely like if you get deep into, like there's so much stuff you can do with software, like you could build your own engine, you can, um, you know, you could build a whole application, you do websites. Uh, sure. It's, it's something I feel like once you get sucked into, like it, you could spend out, you could definitely spend hours, weeks at a time just coding something. And, but yeah, I'm kind of, I don't know, cut my time between both. I don't know, it's just how I am, I suppose. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's great for the uh, video game world, especially when you have teams of two or three people. Right, yeah, um, I, I find most of those people, like indie developers, you kind of have to have multiple skills. Like having an art skill, yeah. coding skill is a useful thing because your team is small. And, yeah. you know, it is, in a way, your artistic, creative expression. Um, sure. In its entirety, your code and your, your game your artwork, your music, whatever you're trying to view your game with. Yeah. So you had mentioned that you're still doing game development sort of yeah. stuff. Uh, what are you working on right now? Um, I'm currently working in Los Angeles at a company called Nix Hydra, and we make a, a visual novel game called Nick, uh, called The Arcana, and I'm okay. an engineer there. Uh, something that I've been working on since 2014 as a kind of sister website to this Mortal Coil is this thing called The Shrine, which is also, I call it a virtual place. It's kind of like, well, a, like a virtual park slash Shinto shrine. Nice. And it's, it's an offshoot of this Mortal Coil, like it's another branch of it. Uh, in, in that world, well, it's still part of the Mortal Coil universe, but uh, Kamiko is the land deity of that shrine. And uh, you can visit there during any time of the day, and um, and different characters show up during the day and during the night. Uh, you know, it's there is there are things that you can do that you can do at kind of like a real Shinto shrine, such as like draw draw uh, draw Emma cards, write your wishes, and basically kind of like send them to the gods or send them into the ether, basically. And cool. since she's a modern deity, she, of course she has a Twitter account and she tweets those images out. <laughs> um, so I did want to ask you, uh, th this, this was professionally printed or self, oh, sorry, That's was self -published. this? That's self-published. Okay, self-published. Self and did you also go through CreateSpace for this? Uh, originally I did a prototype in CreateSpace, but um, okay. CreateSpace is mainly for publishing print word novels. And yeah, they're really good at doing that. They're they're good at doing. They're decent at doing coloring books, but the paper's not quite the right quality. Doing comic books, create space isn't so great. They have a problem with registering the CYMK. So in sure. the version I printed with them, there was a lot of ghosting. Um, this is all done. This is done with Kablam. And you can see they've done a very beautiful job. They had some issue with I think they called it and some is that binding issue. Kablam does digital printing and um, offset printing, or just digital. Um, they're like a print on demand, so I want to okay, say yeah. they do digital. So digital yeah, because I was curious, I saw that you had spot color, and unfortunately for um, digital printing, that's just they're just going to charge you a full color rate for that. Basically, right? like when yeah. I looked at it, it's like I had to do full color because it's like there are s splashes of color here and there. Some pages do have a lot of color. Um, yeah, and that's something that you planned from the start, or you were just from the start. Okay. Yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I love the 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 heavy blacks that uh, you have in your work. Yeah, um, actually, one of the aside from the story, one of the other things I came up with uh, is like if I were going to do this as a comic, I wanted to do it in this high contrast black and white style. Sure. Um, and it's like so drastically different than a lot of what Lolita stuff does. So it's cool yeah, to see it's very different. Lolita dresses rendered with heavy black styles, um, and particularly women rendered with heavy black styles, because a lot of work like that. Um, has very male focused it, cast. It, it's very noirish, and I've had a lot of friends tell me like it look, has that very kind of detective noir look. I mean, yeah, Sin yeah. City is, the, I think, the obvious example sure. um, of this high contrast style with like splashes of color, which is kind of where I where I stole it from. <laughs> but I, mean, I really like borrowed. It. Yeah, borrowed. yeah, sure. <laughs> um, um, so. Did you always intend to release a print form of the comic? Uh, you, you introduced it as a webcomic. I introduced um, it as a webcomic. I did design all the pages as if I were one day going to print it. So, okay, yeah, so when I started. It was definitely a possibility from the start. If right, not, right. When I definitely. started the project from day one, I was like, I want to make sure I can do the full breadth of what I can with this work. So, digital, uh, print, 
um, and you know art prints and so on. Okay. And what was the inspiration for? I'm sorry, you said it was called uh, the Shrine. The Shrine, yeah. Yeah. Um, like, how did you? Did, did you just wanted to explore more in the world, or it's something like you thought it would reach a different audience and bring more attention to the comic? Yeah. So it's a little bit of both those things. One was, okay. um, as I would produce a comic, I, I realized doing a graphic novel like this on the side would take four to five years or something. Sure. And I was like, well, I need. I would like another way to tell a story. And, yeah. Uh, I thought visual novel might be a nice compromise. Plus, I would get to use my engineering skills and do something more with uh, with the characters and something different. Yeah. Of course, you know, it, it's a good idea, but it's not that easy because there's a lot of assets and things to create. Yeah. But, um, you know, I wanted to explore, and I think of it less of a game and more of just like a piece of uh, art, like an interactive piece of art that's on the web. You can go there, it looks like a, it looks like a picture, and it changes over the course of the day. If, if characters show up, you can you can poke at them and they'll talk to you and you can interact with them. There's oh. some things you can do that are similar to what you could do at a real Shinto shrine. Yeah. And, uh, and I, <coughs> excuse me, I basically have like this, uh, what I would say an alpha milestone framework of what, it's like a vertical slice of what you can do. Yeah. And then now the next step is to kind of expand it and build it into something more. Yeah, more game-like. Is Maybe more... like I'm exploring it because it's like it's goofy. Like part of it was like it's another way to advertise it. It's another way of another entry point into the world of this mortal coil. Like yeah, you find the shrine. Maybe you building find the comics. your franchise basically. Basically, and then uh, and then uh, I forgot my train of thought, but yes, <laughs> sure. Uh, so how is your process different for uh, building a visual <clears throat> novel versus uh, building a graphic novel? Do you do you work sequentially? I guess first of all for so, the Mortal Coil. Yeah, with. Um, with the rabbit and the moon, I actually scripted the all first, and I did several revisions, and then storyboards. Okay. And then you know, kind of like a step-by-step -step process. I'm yeah. Sure, you would hand it off to five different people, but it's, if when it's just you, it's like you just kind of pipeline and just do it one step at a time. Yeah. Well, I've talked to a few people who do tend to work more loosely. I guess a canonical example would be. Um, I'm not gonna be able to think of the name. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. With the with the second, I have a second, uh, like a it's more of a four coma style web comic of this mortal coil on the site now called The Lady of the Moon, which is actually kind of a follow up to this one. Okay. And it's done uh, first in four panels, but a little more chibi, a little more loose. Like I didn't come there, I didn't come to it with a final script. Yeah. Um, one thing I noticed, one thing I thought of as I was working on this giant graphic novel is that. After a couple of years, like the voice of the character lose changes. a little steam. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. It, That's interesting. I don't think it was. So are you, are you steam. kind of second guessing decisions you made like a couple of years ago? Or? I don't think it's second guessing decisions as much. Well, okay, yes, there is part of that. And that's where you start cutting chapters and things. Like when when I saw the full scale of the production of what I'd have to do, yeah. and counted out basically the number of hours based on the pages that had to be yet to be done. Yeah, it was like okay, some of this needs to get cut if I want to be able just to finish it and ship a final product, and be done with it. Cool. So yeah, that's on. that actually sounds a lot like how game designers will plan things out just yeah. with an Excel spreadsheet saying, well, I know these assets will right. take this, this long. Is like, this is like the hardcore kind of production project management kind of side. <laughs> yeah, uh, so it's interesting that you're, you're approaching your own comic like that. I mean, well, I it's, think it's I good to, because you, yeah, you should be because, focused on producing something right, in the long run. Right, right. Because uh, otherwise and you, you don't get, have to suck all your creativity out just to do that. You just yeah. need to be realistic about what you and can actually, actually accomplish. I, I think it also helps creatively because you, when you look at what's, when I looked at what was left, it's like, I could, there are parts I can condense. There are parts that seem completely unnecessary. Sure. And I can chop it out. And I feel like in the end, it helped make the story uh, better. And awesome. of course, it cut a year's worth of production out of it, which then allowed me to go explore new ideas for this mortal coil, okay. and not just uh, not just continue to keep drawing the same thing. Um, and then getting back to what I was saying about uh, it wasn't that the story was getting stale; it was that my concept of the character in the world was evolving. Like it evolved over those four years, and this yeah. is like a representation of what it was four or five years ago. And now I'm starting to move on, and it wasn't. Yeah, I guess you could say it wasn't as fresh. Uh, and I wanted to be a little more improv improvisational. So when I did the Lady of the Moon as a four panel or a series of four panels, I started uh, uh, 
like I started with a core concept and then from there I just uh, you know just kind of improvised store like you know comic strips from that and I built kind of a story arc and I ended it somewhere okay uh, it's not as perfectly put together as the rabbit in the moon but you know it's it was an experiment and uh, I feel like the next comic I want to do is somewhere in between the way that a big graphic novel is done because I like that look okay and something that's more more four panel like because that's something that it, you know responds I think better on the internet yeah because people want to consume things in bite-sized chunks, basically. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, when you see what most most of the comics that seem to gather lots of traction, it's a lot more uh, gag-like. It's four, pa three, four panels. Yeah, yeah, it's a little simpler looking, and plus also it cuts the production down down by a quarter. Like it's 20, pa 20 hours for a page of this comic versus say five or six hours for a four-panel comic. Wow. So, Are you working traditionally or digitally? Uh, everything's done digitally using uh, Clip Paint Studio. Okay. Nice. Uh, yeah, that would probably be why you have such smooth lines in there, because everything's <laughs> yeah. um, uh, vector-based. Actually, it's not vector-based. Oh, okay. It's you're, all done in raster, you're... like at 600 DPI. Okay. Uh, the nice thing is I can turn it into vector-based, like using Inkscape. I can yeah. take the original art and put it in there. And actually, it traces fairly well nice. from bitmap to Yeah, so if you wanted to produce like a giant banner or something, uh, it'd some, be of the, some of those prints are actually done that way. I think that one yeah. of Kamiko with the speech bubble, the purple and blue one, that one was done by blowing up an image and after turning it to a vector. Cool. And um, I, I'd ask how your process was different between your graphic novel and producing something like The Shrine. Um, are, did you plan out everything for The Shrine beforehand? I mean, I know you said it's not quite finished, it's just yeah, a vertical slice. The, the thing with like game development, like there's, like I plan as much as I could, but things change as you you know, things change with video games as you make them yeah, as well. Yeah, you have some idea and you realize how difficult it will be to implement, right. so you just end up cutting that, basically. And, yeah, <laughs> sometimes you sit there and you think, like, how many assets will I need? How many hours will it take to produce those assets? What kind of code will I need? What, you know, what's actually feasible within a certain time frame? And yeah, how reusable will this be? <laughs> right, or how, like, even how useful it will be. Like, will it really, you know, help the bottom, the bottom line of this thing? Okay. Uh, or say whatever it's trying to say. And so there are things that I did to make the vertical slice work. And then there's kind of like secondary things that I'm basically holding off till later. It's like if I could build traction for it or if I started a Patreon for it or something and there yeah. was some way of getting it funded, then I would just definitely continue to build more and more features into it. But I don't want to like, I don't want to overload with lots of feature creep. I just want the core of what it is. I understand. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so that you're not distracting people uh, from right. the, the the final product that you want to right. produce, or as they say in Silicon Valley, it's a minimum viable product. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is what matters, like getting it done, getting it out there, and then sharing it with people and okay. seeing what their response is to it. Um, would you have any advice to an artist who's uh, wanting to get into game development but doesn't have any coding skills necessarily? I feel like my Pro probably more towards the visual novel sort of side right, rather right. than, or maybe producing assets for. Um, other independent games, but uh, I definitely feel partnering with somebody. Like if you're doing an independent like game, uh, it, I feel like it helps to have somebody else. And it, nothing really okay. to do with like definitely skill. Like if you partner with an engineer, that's helpful because then he can do the engineering work, and while if, if you're an artist, you can do the artwork. But also because uh, I think someone who works alone tends to spin their wheels a lot. Like, yeah, I have friends down south. Uh, like they're working on stuff and they just kind of they've been working on them for years without without end and uh, really it's like I feel like for a project you have to have an end somewhere so you can move on to the next thing or move on even to the next milestone of your project sure so it helps to have somebody there so to keep you sane to basically. keep you sane basically <laughs> to tell you like if what you're doing is like you're getting too too much into the weeds or you're getting too crazy with one small aspect when it maybe it doesn't matter to the bigger picture of what you're making. Okay, so basically just start trying to find communities of independent game developers and find somebody find someone, who has a find someone you can um, work with. complimentary skill set to yeah, you. Yeah, someone, someone with a complimentary skill set helps. Someone who can keep you from spinning your wheels definitely helps. Um, and yeah, even networking beyond that and, find, and finding other indies, I think is, is useful because you don't know what kind of connections you can make uh, out there. Sure. 
Okay, and would you have any advice to someone who's considering tabling at 8 for the first time? Um, hmm. Uh, definitely, I, there's like things I feel like that definitely has to get done, like your board of equalization paperwork. Uh, okay. I don't know. Because I didn't, California conventions can be a little complicated. Right. Uh, and, and also not creating a ton of merch. Like, I mostly just wanted to come here to sell this book. And okay. I had this, so that I brought that. Um, of course. These tchotchkes I created as just to explore, to see like... Different price points, Different price points, to table. see what really, what would be popular, what people would pick up. Same with the art prints. Um, so yeah, I mean, if nothing else, art prints act like signs for your work, so... Right. <laughs> as long as it's not just fan art, like, it can, right. it can definitely be helpful. Right, exactly. But yeah, I came here mainly to sell this book. Okay, so just focus on having one polished product before right. you attend to show the right. Yeah, don't, don't overload yourself with lots of little other things. Like, get, I would get, get whatever the core thing you want to do and, uh, and Wrap put that up. as your main, main product and sell that. Okay, well, thank you so much for talking to me. Yeah, I hope sure you have thing. a good ape. Yeah, you too.